All right, cool. We are officially live. So y'all ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Okay. Well, my name is Alfonso McGriff III. And my focus tonight is on harmonious and productive communication. My goal is to share some information that you can take away and use to improve your ability to communicate. And that's what it's about. I have this staff with me. I keep this staff with me because this staff is my personal reminder that what I think I know is little to nothing. And one of the things that I like to say is what we think we know is but a speck of dust from a grain of sand and a puzzle piece that's made up of an infinite number of grains of sand and a puzzle that's made up of an infinite number of puzzle pieces in a universe that's made up of an infinite number of puzzles in a potentially infinite number of universes. So when we go back to what we think we understand, it, it really technically adds up to nothing. But the other part of that is this. There's so much we don't know, we have no idea what's not possible which means that everything we can think of is possible. It's just a matter of us growing into understanding so that we can make manifest what we thought of into reality. And sometimes a lifetime is not long enough to bring it into fruition. But there are many things that we can think of that we can bring into fruition in our lifetime when we put our minds to it. So I'm here starting out saying that what I know is very little, but I'm just sharing the little that I think I understand, and I don't claim that it's all right, and I got it all figured out. I'm just sharing what I know based on my own limited understanding. Now. One of the things that got me focused on harmonious and productive communication is that when I was about 12 or 13 years ago, what year is this? 2018? Yeah. In 1998, I could, I could tell you the year. In 1998, I was at the apex of anger. I was angry about history. I was angry about uh, race issues, I was angry about everything. And I really believed at that time, I was convinced that if you black in America and you not angry, you must be something wrong with you. And I just heard Dr. Boyce Watkins say that recently. And to me, that is just so far from where we need to be as it relates. That's how I was thinking in 1998. Now we have a brother that's brilliant and reaching millions of people, repeating that. If you not, if you black in America and you not angry, you must be crazy. So um, that's what I bought into in 1998. I was angry, I was at the apex of my anger. And so when I would study history and read books, I was studying and I got a whole bunch of books at home that I used to read diligently for the purpose of uh, learning information. And then going out here when people are talking, if they said something that I thought didn't make sense, I thought it was my personal responsibility given to me by God himself to verbally remove their head from their shoulders. So I was, I was out of control. And fast forward, you know, and, and, I, and I, I was into poetry at the time and 
I was writing these poems, um, trying to find a way to release. I just got into poetry as a release. I never considered myself a poet who carries a notebook and has these thoughts and writes poetry. I had so much to say and nowhere to say it, so I said, if I reshape some of these thoughts into a poetic form, I can invade some of these poetry spots and release some of this stuff I got on my mind because I had just too much. And so the turning point for me was one day I was at a house party and it was a lot of poets and creative people and writers and all of these kind of people at this house party. And I was invited, and um, actually, at that time, I was kind of surprised I was invited, because I wasn't even getting too many <laughs> invitations to, people wouldn't even invite me to their cookouts. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, no, I'm trying to help you understand how, how heavy this was. So, and, and so I, I never forget this. I was, you know, walking through the party and there's music playing and everything's cool. And I walked in the kitchen and it was this heavy conversation going on in the kitchen. So I went in there, you know, and I, I stood around, I started looking around. And when I walked in, people started filing out of the kitchen. And you ever talk about energy, people was feeling, and you know, and, and I was laying in the cut. I was waiting for my time to, to, to dig in some cakes. You know, I, I was sitting there lo locked and loaded, right? And so, but at the same time, I noticed these people just kind of started leaving. And I was like, damn. You know, I had a moment of clarity but I was, I, was, I was still heavy in my, my ignorance. So I had this feeling like, you know, I want to be heard also. And it crossed my mind like, wow, I, I might need to adjust my approach. So you believe in because you walk in? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, and one of the reasons why I know it was because I walked in it was, a, it was a few people still in there, and one of the guys in there was trying to, like, show he's not intimidated and stand up to me. And he was saying something, and I was looking at him, and I, I, I was just daggers, wham, blam. I was this, his head was slowly being chiseled from his shoulders. <laughs> And he started yelling. He was mad, you know. Now, I had that moment where I felt these people leaving because I walked in. Now I am literally doing exactly what I do, which is why the people who, who, who knew what was going to happen bounced. And so the guy, he, he got beside, he's yelling. And his girlfriend and the host, the person whose house it was, was, you know how somebody tries to calm this person down, but they look at you? Yeah. <laughs> so she did kind of one of those like it was my fault. Now, in my mind, I'm not yelling and out of control. He is. You know, and I still really didn't see it. Even I had that moment. However, when I went home later on that night, I, you know, I replayed everything and I thought about it and I said, I got to start changing how I, because, you know, it's not getting anywhere. People are angry and I'm angry and we, we just ain't, it's just, we're not getting anywhere. And now it's at the point where I can't even be heard because I think um, if they hadn't walked out, it might have taken me longer because I would have been fine as long as they stayed and heard me. You understand? Because I, I, I was feeling like it was my responsibility to let them know. <laughs> and, and I would be, I would be, uh, I would not be doing uh, 
what is best for black people if I don't let them know. Right. So, right. So I, uh, but after I thought about it, I said, I got to start making adjustments. I got to start making adjustments. And so as I personally began making adjustments, trying this, saying, okay, well, what if I do it like this? And, and I started seeing, and these little things were working. So like after about six months, I started writing the stuff down, like the different things I'm trying and the thoughts that were coming to me. Because it's amazing how our brain works. It's like when we open up to something, the universe says, okay, well, you're ready to receive this and start handing you stuff. Mm -hmm. So the more I opened up to trying to, um, to adjust to a better communication style, the more things I started receiving. And so earlier I was speaking about how I was getting all of this unsolicited and unearned respect on this cruise that I was just on. And I noticed the same way those people walked out because they felt my energy. The transformation that I've been putting myself through with this recent experience and this experience with people in general, like even I was in Whole Foods and this lady just said, you just, you just look so regal. And she was just, I, you know, it was almost like I was still on the ship, but it wasn't, you know, it's not a ship thing. It's more, it has more to do with how, I, how I'm carrying myself. Mm -hmm. And so the contrast, because here in Hartford, when somebody thinks they know you, that's all that matters. They, it, it, the interesting thing is when people think they know you, they no longer can feel you. Because they look at you and see you, boom, that's what you are. That's it. They, they can't feel you. But people who don't know you, the only thing they can go by is what they're feeling, the energy and stuff they're getting from you. So being home in Hartford, And all the work I've been doing on myself and everything. People who know you just, yeah, A, B, whatever. Man, shut up. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. You know, just, just, they just see you as who they know, you know. And they don't really get a chance to feel, give themselves a chance to feel you or your energy or what you're about. And so this experience on the cruise was such that these are thousands of people that didn't know me from Adam. But no matter how I was dressed, if my energy wasn't right, they would have felt that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The same way those people felt my energy in the kitchen. So it was great to get away and know that the work that I've been doing on myself is actually manifesting itself in me and through me. So that's why I focus so hard on harmonious and productive communication because I think is very important and I think that we can all benefit from it you know uh, but we have to have a desire to communicate better and interact with each other better there is nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves and no matter what anybody says no matter what excuses they use or no matter what excuses we use, we reveal how we feel about ourselves by how we carry ourselves. This white guy, this was after the cruise. They had a post-cruise party in Fort Lauderdale. The day we got off the ship, that night they had a post-cruise party. And I was standing with these sisters, some more people who were asking me to take pictures. And this white dude just walked up to me and like, you know, like did my shirt like that and said, I have one question for you. And I said, what's up? How can I help you? Now, it's so crazy because the women were ready to scratch his eyes out. Mm -hmm. Cause they didn't, they didn't like his yeah. approach, his energy, nothing. For me, it didn't even phase me. 
I didn't even feel any kind of way. And um, yeah, so he, he, so what, what, I have one question for you. Why do you dress like that? And I said, I dress like this because I'm a king and I'm supposed to. And as a king, I have to carry myself as such and dress as such. So the women was like, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they were so happy because they wanted to get him, you know, for doing what he did, you know, just flipping my clothes. And I don't really care how, what his reaction or response was or anything, but it just stopped him in his tracks and he was like, wow. He said, that's the best answer to any question I've asked in a really long time. And he was like, okay, okay. And you know, he just walked away. But there's nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. And then I have a question. The question is this. If it was your choice, would you want to be happy and at peace all the time? And at peace. Just have personal peace and be happy. Sure. I had to say it. <laughs> you did? I did. I had to say it. Yeah, that's that colonial conditioning. It could be. No, I'm just harassing you. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. Because. Because I just. Because I'm not going to say it. Because I don't want to get into this situation. No, not really. I'm just thinking about when I write. And different things come from different places. But I've never considered writing from a place where everything is peace and everything is harmonious. With you? With me. Right. Yes, because there's, I kind of like the revelations that come. Right. Now, we're going to get back to that, but I'm going I'm to I'm deal with this question. What, what about you? Huh? I would love to have personal peace all the time. And what about and being happy? Both. You would love to, right? I would love to. And if it was up to you, you would. I would. I'll, yes. So, so what that actually means is, when you don't have it, it's because something or somebody else made the choice. Mm. Mm. Wow. I'm with that. That's true. I'm with that. Because if it was up to you. You have it all the time. Now, if you don't have it all the time, it means something or somebody else made the choice for you. So for me, that means that, which is that, that, that this is the reason why I have taken the, made the declaration that I will never blame somebody else for the quality of my reality. Because I have the ability to determine how I feel from one minute to the next. I really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I hand that over to somebody else, I don't know how I'm going to end up feeling. But if I leave it in my hands, I know how I have a desire to feel. And now, in an environment like the one we're in, where the rhythm of this nation is conflict and confrontation, we have to take back our control over ourselves, and it's possible. I think of where I was 20 years ago and where I am now. It was easy to blame somebody else for my conditions. That's why I'm so mad, because they put me in this position, <laughs> right? So think about that. If, it, if, if you had control, you would make sure you had your personal peace and happiness, and why not? And when you don't have it, that means you handed it over to somebody else. Somebody else got that control. So again, that's why it's so important for us to understand that there's nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. Now, tonight, I want to talk about 
how to have a harmonious and productive conversation. We call that a conscious conversation. It's very important to understand when I say conscious conversation because it's a type of conversation that I'm referencing that I established as a conscious conversation. All of the other kind of conversations you have, more power to you. And if it's working for you, that's beautiful. But I'm talking about a conscious conversation. And a conscious conversation at the foundation of a conscious conversation are these six basic ground rules. At the foundation of a conscious conversation are these six basic ground rules. Now, because of how we've been conditioned to think and trained and all that kind of stuff, some of these are going to be kind of rough <laughs> for us. But one of the things I want to, I'm, before I go over these six basic ground rules, I want to address what my sister over here was talking about when she hesitated about uh, being at peace and happy. And, and there is, when we're writing and stuff, there is, Uh, like almost a desire for the diverse feelings associated with writing. We want to be expressive and express how we're feeling in this and that and the other. But there's two things that I want to say. Number one is that is understandable. But have we ever tried the other side? Meaning writing from a place of personal peace and happiness Absolutely. and making a contribution from that standpoint and seeing things from that place. It's obvious we're comfortable with this diverse sadness and anger and all of these different ways of expressing ourselves, but, but, but have we really given ourselves a chance on the other side? That's one of the things I like to do because I look at it, I could, I could, I could still feel if, if I was in a, in a place of anger mm -hmm. or hurt. I could still write about that anger and hurt, but I could do it um, where it's already accepted, forgiven, let go, and I'm now in a place where I'm good. It's something that happened, I learned from it, I'm good. So I think I think that when I write, it's from a a, a peaceful <clears throat> a peaceful place. Well, you can basically you're saying I can write about anger and sadness from a peaceful being, place. Being right? that I have ex experienced it, I mm -hmm. know how it felt. Right. I know what I dealt with. I can write about that. Right. But I could do it from so a present place yeah. of being at peace because regardless of what it was, it's done. Right. So and I choose to let it go and just, I'm good. So now, okay, the next question then is this. How much of this anger and sadness is the result of you handing over your personal peace? to somebody else, and then blaming them for making you feel a certain way. I mean, that's not a, a answerable kind of question. That's just something we have to deal with personally. Because a lot of these things that we see ourselves expressing in anger and sadness, is all of the, a lot of these things are based on how we've been conditioned to, to function in this society and this setup. So, when we move from the place or move from the foundation of taking responsibility for ourselves and our feelings and not allowing others to determine how we feel from one second to the next, how much anger and sadness or negative emotional stuff are we going to really end up writing about when we become responsible for our feelings and begin working on that part? And one of the other things I want to say is this.
Afri African American culture. African American culture, or, or, or the acceptance of being African American, the acceptance of African American culture, is um, no. African American culture and af being African American has everything to do with accepting expressions and reflections of oppression as part of our reality, as our life foundation, as our um, culture. And what I mean by that, expressions and reflections of oppression, this is just my perspective, it's not necessarily the truth. We're functioning with a consciousness created by white people over 300 and something period. They had 300 unedited, uninterrupted years of control over our consciousness. So now what happens is we are constantly functioning from a, a, a release of expressions and reflections of oppression. Our African-American culture is, is a result. It's, it's not a proactive reality. It's a resulting reality of being oppressed. So what I mean is this. Blues... When you listen to blues, it's an expression and reflection of oppression. R&B, gospel, hip hop, all of these genres that we mostly created are expressions and reflections of oppression. From this day forward, when you go to a poetry reading, especially when it's mostly black folk, and you go to storybook reading, especially when it's black folks, what you're gonna constantly hear is expressions and reflections of oppression. And expressions and reflections of oppression are thoughts that are the result of being in an oppressive environment. It's, it's, it, they are reactionary thoughts or responsive thoughts to being in an oppressive environment. You start listening to some of these blues, you start listening to some of this hip hop, you start listening to all of these things that we are so great at. And a lot of it becomes expressions and reflections of oppression. That's just the perspective of mine. So I understand the diversity associated with how we express ourselves. But I'm also looking at the root, which is two things. Number one is conditioning. We can't like avoid that. As a matter of fact, according to me, we have yet to begin the recovery process because we think we're okay because we can do what white people can do. And we can live where white people can live. And we can send our kids to school where white people go to school. So we think we're okay. When in all actuality, we have yet to address the fact that we're out of our natural minds. We're functioning with a consciousness created by white people. And as a result of that, most of what we write, what we sing, and how we express ourselves are expressions and reflections of oppression. You go to the African American Museum, and I haven't been there, and I already know I'm gonna walk in there and I'm gonna see a half a billion dollar expression and reflection of oppression. Anytime we talk about the first black NCAA team, the first black baseball player, the first black football player, the, the, the first black woman, the this, that, all of that stuff, expressions and reflections of oppression. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, do you understand what I mean when I talk about expressions and reflections of oppression? That's, that's the point that I'm making. So we got a half a billion dollar expression and reflection of oppression. We call it African American culture. African American culture is one huge expression and reflection of oppression because we have yet to begin the healing process. We were sidetracked into believing that as long as if we can send our kids to school with white people and do what they do, we're free. 
And so we never address the consciousness and the fact that we're out of our natural minds. And like I always talk about the bear on the bicycle, if you can see a bear riding a bicycle and know that bear is out of its natural mind, it's, it's on a bike. If you laid the bike down in the woods, the bear would never pick the bike up and say, I want to learn how to ride it. If by the time you see a bear on a bicycle, it is out of its natural mind. And that's three or four years. They had us for three or four hundred uninterrupted years creating the consciousness we function with. So now we have all these different various types of reflections and expressions of oppression that go by different names. And we got a half a billion dollar museum, one big, huge expression and reflection of oppression and that's what the African American is. African American is one who has accepted expressions and reflections of oppression as our culture, according to me. Until we address the fact that we're functioning with a consciousness they created and we need to recover our own, that's pretty much where we're gonna be at. So all of that came out of your hesitance. It made me think, about why we think and we believe that is a natural part of life. That's, that's to be pissed off and have these various diverse types of emotions that we can reflect on in our writing and in our songs and in our poetry and all that I stuff. I believe that various types of emotions are not solely at the root of oppression when it comes to artistic expression or the expression of people who are considered African American or whatever you want to call yourself. Um, I think that through art we witness an evolution of whatever that individual is learning or unlearning. I think the most profound thing I ever saw as I was coming up was um, the very end of higher learning. Not even everything that happened within the film, but the last word on the screen, which was unlearn. And a lot of times, because we are in families and those families carry on traditions, which can be reflections of oppression, because this is what they believe is their reality, they continue to pass that on until someone is tired enough of what's been happening to want to create a different path for themselves. A lot of times people have to understand that they have that ability to create a different path. You have to understand that you have no limits. But even in thinking that I have what so-called successful people have, and if the only successful people you know of are white, then you think you have arrived, that within itself is a limitation. But I don't think that we can go from expressions of oppression to universal mindset without the middle passage. What's the middle passage? The middle passage is understanding where you are in terms of that we are out of our natural minds whether it's out of your natural minds whether it's you have to unlearn some things mm -hmm. whether it's you are following family, family traditions that have always been dysfunctional no matter what it is that you have to shed in order to get to that limitless mm -hmm. place right you still have that journey in the middle to right. get from a to b yeah, because that was the journey, I mean, from 1998 to 2018. Right. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that if blues came out of your journey, that you can't enjoy that blues process, because that blues is a part of the evolution that brings you to the next phase. You can't say that um, being in the kitchen was oppressive because everyone walked away from my ego. No, because that moment was pivotal. Well, no, no. I can say blues is a reflection and expression of oppression. 
I can. I can say in many cases, gospel is a reflection and expression of oppression. I can say any time a black person says or brags about the first black anything, it is an expression and reflection of oppression. How are you the first people on the planet, but you've allowed somebody to redefine first, so now you're the first black person? Well, and, and, an agreement on that. And, and, and in the context of being the first black, then white people are your standard. Mm -hmm. So for me, again, and, and I understand what you're saying, but I'm, I'm definitely coming from a different place. And the place that I'm coming from is this. When somebody has, if you can see how after four years a bear is out of his natural mind and it is functioning with a consciousness created by the trainer and it is literally riding a bicycle in a circle. Four years. I don't, it's, it would be impossible for me to not understand what has taken place over three to four hundred years with our consciousness. And no matter what that middle passage is between expressions and reflections of oppression and the universal approach to life, it is my personal opinion based on my own limited understanding again, which is not the most correct, that until we address this consciousness thing, because it is at the root of our thoughts and our decisions and our actions. Until we address this consciousness thing and the fact that we are functioning with a consciousness somebody else created, then we'll continue doing things like marching and protesting and boycotting. Something's wrong with that picture. When we did it 60 years ago, for the exact same reason we're doing it 60 years later. Something's wrong with that picture. Something has to be wrong with the state of our consciousness and what is being passed down by so-called intelligent people to next generations. Bringing youth out there marching and protesting for the exact same reasons today that they did it 60 years ago, doing the exact same thing. Something's wrong with that picture. That is one of the most obvious indications of something going wrong in our consciousness that I see out here today. Doing the exact same thing 60 years later for the exact same reasons. Not catching on. That if you do the same thing over and over again, expect a different results. You're crazy. That's what they say. I choose to use a more sensitive word or approach. We are still out of our natural minds. And that is why we find ourselves doing, doing these things. And very intelligent people continue to teach our young people to go out here and do this stuff. Where at the same time, if I ask any mother, black mother that I know, would you send your five-year-old into a school where the students hate them? The teachers hate them, the community hates them, and the police that are escorting them in hates their freaking guts in the name of integrating, having a right to go to school where you want and integrating white schools. Would you do that? Would you traumatize your five-year-old like that? I haven't, I haven't met a parent that said they would. I ask people today, would you go sit at a lunch counter? and let a bunch of white people spit on you, spit in your food, serve you food with feces in it, pour flour and water and dump all manner of things on you so that you can have the right or demonstrate the right to be able to eat where white people eat? Would you do that today? No, no. So, so, so what I'm saying is something was wrong with that. And we have the ability to look back and reflect and say, hey, there was a valid approach. And that's why our theme for Harford's Lit is teaching our youth to stand on the shoulders of the ancestors and not walk in their footsteps. 
And in order to do that, we have to be able to openly question everything they did. Mm -hmm. yes. And take what made sense and leave everything that didn't make sense. Because they did some things that didn't make sense. You know how I know? Because as a human being I am, I know I did some things 20 years ago that didn't make sense. And they were all human beings. And I know Malcolm X and Martin Luther King would not be doing the same thing today that they did 50 years ago. So why are we? Because, according to me, I have diagnosed us as out of our natural minds. So now... <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, ground rules for a conscious conversation. Ground rules for a conscious, a conscious conversation. During a conscious conversation, understanding is much more important than agreement and disagreement. During a conscious conversation, understanding is much more important than agreement or disagreement. We don't, we don't have conscious conversations for the purpose to come to an agreement. That's not why we have conscious conversations. We have conscious conversations so that we can understand each other. And what I like about understanding is if we're trying to understand each other, even if we don't quite understand each other, our minds are still open enough when we leave, we can reflect on it and think about it and maybe grab some things that made more sense later on than it did when we were in the moment. Because sometimes, you know, we're sensitive. When something touches our emotions, we kind of shut down, even if we're masking it by presenting ourselves as chilling. So when we're having a conscious conversation, we give ourselves a chance to reflect on what's been said and potentially learn at a later time from what has transpired during the conversation. So we, 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 don't, we don't look for agreement. We look for understanding. Number two, during the conscious conversation, we challenge the idea or the philosophy. We challenge the idea or the philosophy. We challenge the idea or the philosophy in a respectful manner. However, we never engage in personal attacks. We challenge the idea of philosophy, however, we never engage in personal attacks. And sometimes we'll find this will happen in, during a, a conversation, the traditional conversations. Somebody doesn't like what's been said or how somebody says something, and the next thing you know, there's an attack. See, well, that's why you got on them funny looking shoes. <laughs> See, now, now we're going to change the whole narrative here. We, we, we do not engage in personal attacks when having a conscious conversation. Number three, during a conscious conversation, if more than one person is speaking at a time, we declare that a fight. And we don't fight when we have conscious conversations. We allow one person to speak at a time. Sometimes we get the itch to interrupt because we're going to forget our thought. That is the reason that we use for interrupting people. Well, you, you're taking a long time. and I, now Listen, you got a smartphone. You got a little notebook on your smartphone. Type in what you want to say on your little notebook on your smartphone so you won't forget. Please don't use that in this technological age as a reason to interrupt somebody. So, when we're having a conscious conversation, we only have one person speaking at a time. If more than one person is speaking, we declare that a fight, and we do not have fights in conscious conversation. During a conscious conversation, we never, ever announce that somebody is wrong. You can say that in the classroom at school. You can say that in the debates you're having with the fellas and y'all debate. You can say that in all your regular conversations that we all do anyway. We, we'll call somebody wrong in a minute. 
we even call them wrong as two left shoes. <laughs> but in a conscious conversation, we never announce that somebody is wrong. And there's a reason for that. Because number five, during a conscious conversation, everybody's right. If the goal is to have a conscious conversation, then everybody is right. No one is wrong. For each of us, the only relevant history we bring to the conversation is our own, and it is our truth. And that goes for every one of us. So even from the standpoint, if I came in the conversation and said, five plus four is 10, and you said five plus five is 10, in the conscious conversation, you explain how you got 10, and if I can, I'll explain how I got nine. I mean, you explain how five plus five is 10, and I'll explain how five plus four is 10. That's how we do it in a conscious conversation. Everybody's right. Because if I ask you, how do you know five plus five is 10? What you gonna tell? <laughs> I'll see what it's going. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. If I ask you how you know 5 plus 5 is 10, what, 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 what you going to tell? Because my left hand plus my right hand is 10. Because that's how you was taught, right? Okay. You, was, <laughs> you was taught about your left hand. You had to be taught that. How you know your left hand is your left hand? So my mama said. Okay. <laughs> my point exactly. My point exactly. Yes. So everybody coming into the conversation based on how they was taught. It might not necessarily be how you was taught. But if you can say, well, this is how I got five plus five, and they can say, well, you know what, that makes sense. Or it doesn't. Because five plus four is ten to me. And we can leave it at that. We don't have to conclude somebody's right. Because remember, we, we, we're not looking for agreement or disagreement, just understanding. And whether or not you can explain how you got 10 from 5 plus 4 doesn't matter in a conscious conversation. But if you can explain it, that's fine. If you can't, that's fine. This is why a conscious conversation is so different. Because we eliminate the potential for conflict and confrontation based on the ground rules we set here. Trying to have a conscious conversation. And the final one, during the conscious conversation, we try to avoid passive aggressive behavior. One of the most aggravating things um, that can happen is when you're talking and somebody keep raising, you know, and you're trying to, you, you're losing focus and <laughs> the person is, or if you're talking, you know, in the technological age, and they have gone to the phone on you. Now you can see if somebody, you know, understand if they went to the phone to, to copy some notes so they don't want to interrupt you. But if, if they got a solid 10 minutes on the phone, <laughs> Houston, you are violating a conscious conversation. That is passive aggressive behavior in a conscious conversation. <laughs> so, in a conscious conversation, we try to avoid what I call the passive aggressive behavior. So what we're going to do is a quick exercise. And it's a perfect number of people, and I need y'all to speak up. I need everybody to look at this haiku. And when you read it, tell me what it means to you. OK? I need you. To, I want you to speak out loud so people can hear you. And whenever you're ready, let me know what it means to you. Don't read the haiku. Just tell me what it means to you. The first word I thought of is irony. Irony. Mm. I'm hold it. Hold it. I want. I want you to finish. That's it? That's all you got? Yeah. For us? It, 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 it
it, it kind of, you know, you, you think about it and you think about the depth of the song. And then you think about the depth of her own darkness and mm-hmm. and what she was entrapped in. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I never even considered that other side because I was listening to the song. I can dig it. All right. <laughs> and Zima, what's up? What she said about reflecting on her own darkness, um, hanging from these books, I don't know, it's, it's powerful, make me think of um, someone that has demons and um, was looking outwards at other demons and, and not thinking about herself. I can dig it. So you just said what she said. No, what I see is, um, it's a little far-fetched, I think, but I'm seeing that even though she was struggling with her situations, that it's almost like she was still in her reality um, She was still in her reality while dealing with her darker side. It's hard to say, you say don't use these words, but. No, no, I didn't say don't use the words. I said, just don't don't read read it the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it's hard not to use the word, you know, needles because we all know what, you know, what what she dealt with from time to time, but. Time to time. Yeah, I'm trying to be nice. Um, no. <laughs> I think I think it's I think it's kind of wild that she. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's it's just that I just feel like she this is this was her reality. She she had her she had her way of um, expressing herself. Mm-hmm and expressing herself, which I'm thinking was her truth about things while um, dealing with her demons. I can dig it. That's it? That's all you got for us? Yeah. All right. Okay. You got to speak up and see mom. Okay, so I was to add, I was thinking um, that when we talked earlier about personal peace and happiness mm-hmm. and how sometimes we blame others and then when we and then we talked about struggles and oppression reflections and everything and I'm thinking about the fact that she wrote this song if she wrote it herself and someone else wrote it for her mm-hmm. the simple fact that you know when from what we know Billy a lot of us watched the movie looked at it as well I'm stressed, this is what I'm seeing, and so therefore I stepped into something to self-medicate to cope, so I can cope through something. It's almost blaming some of the things she's seeing, um, just making a choice of get going into that, um, to cope, to use I can say I can use mm-hmm. needles or drugs to cope with what she's going through. Right. But um, I don't know. We use the word irony, and I don't think we we just raved about Billy Holiday singing this powerful song, "Strange Fruit," but never thought about her and being that strange fruit. Hmm. Yeah, that I can dig that. <clears throat> She's singing about strange fruit, 
And uh, like you said, never thought about herself being strange fruit. Anything else? What's your take on it? Tashala? Um, I was going to say that it's funny how she could bring so much attention to something that a lot of people saw and a lot of people didn't. But no attention to her own need. Mm-hmm. So the haiku, the haiku says, Billie Holiday sang words about strange fruit while hanging from needles. Billie Holiday sang words about strange fruit while hanging from needles. And when I wrote this, I was thinking of a few things. Number one, how you call it the irony of her singing about strange fruit while she was literally hanging herself with heroin. And from a communication standpoint, I was thinking about how many of us do the same thing on a daily basis every day. We always have things to say about how other people are choosing to live their life when what's going on over here ain't the most sexiest of lives. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, you know, that that's just another point. But, yeah. Um, actually, I'm, I have... I'm, I was writing a book of haikus. I have probably over four or five hundred haikus that I'm going to put in the book eventually down the road one day. But, um, yeah. So, that is that is what that's about. Billy Holiday sang songs about strange fruit while hanging from needles. And, um, yeah, that was pretty heavy. So, what I, I just want to put some impact stories out here, like some things that actually happen. One of the things I always tell people is if you go to, go to Google, and type in argument leads to, and then hit return. Argument leads to and hit return. You'll see a list and pages of tragedies. Mainly because people have allowed their emotions to be out of control. And what happens is when one or more people are operating with out of control emotions we're playing russian roulette now because we don't know how this is going to end we don't know how this is going to end and you know i'm just so funny i'm about to read an impact story <laughs> and um i got my own doggone story the movie theater oh lord you remember the movie theater did i tell you about the movie theater yes you remember his name? What about? Okay, so you didn't hear the movie theater story. Mm. So maybe some people haven't heard the movie theater story. So this taught me so much. You know, um, and so I'm, I'm of the belief that just because anger is an available emotion to us doesn't mean we have to use it. And, and our body is all kind of diseases that are not active. And our immune system is knocking them down and oozing them and all kind of stuff constantly. But when we're under stress and then our immune system gets low and that cortisol gets to floating around and it stiffens our arteries and veins and capillaries and all of these other things go on, then we make ourselves vulnerable to certain things that we would have never been vulnerable to. Right? So um, a lot of times, again, if we take responsibility for ourselves, we can avoid a lot of this stuff. But our body is, is natural. It, it has, there are things it's going to do that it's just going to do. So anyway, I was in the movie theater. I was in the movie theater. And it was in one of the Avenger movies. And it was a bunch of kids in the back. I, 
it was the big BTX theater and I was way in the back and there was some kids back here and they were so excited and they were making so much noise. And um, I was thinking like, man, I might have to change seats. I'm not good with talkers in the movie, like that kind of thing. I, I you know, listen, I, hmm. I'll shoot you a quick elbow wham, you know. Your little nose, your little nose be hurting and stuff. So anyway, <laughs> so so I'm in in the movie theater, and I'm literally considering maybe changing seats because these kids are so excited. But then when the movie was getting ready to start, they all calmed down and they was ready to watch the movie. And right when the movie started, my phone rang. Looked at the phone, it was my young cousin who has a scholarship, basketball scholarship out in New Hampshire somewhere. And he, uh, he, he doesn't call me frivolously. He calls me because there's something going on he got to talk about. So I answered the phone. I said, hey, what's up? And he started talking. So this white man over here he said, hey, you're not supposed to be talking on the phone in the movie theater. Now, I never looked up at him never acknowledged him, never said anything, just because the conversation is going to be not going to last that long. So I said something else in response to my cousin. He said, hey, you're not supposed to be talking on the phone in the movie theater. I know I'm wrong. I'm out of order. Don't make no sense to be arguing with this dude. And I'm at peace. I'm fine. There's no adrenaline rush, nothing. I'm good. I'm just talking to my cousin on the phone. I'm not paying any attention to this guy. So he stands up and stands in front of me and he says, hey, you're not supposed to be talking on the phone in the movie theater. He's arms flailing, he's tripping. I know my cousin, little cousin, wondering what's going on, but I'm continuing to deal with him like, don't worry about that. We're not even going to address that. I never looked up at the man, never said anything to him, anything. I'm just trying to get off the phone. But I'm still, I still got to deal with this. So I, I didn't get his dude no attention, none of me. So he messed around and said, hey, you're not supposed to be on the phone in the movie theater. And he slammed his fist down on my legs. <gasps> So at that point, I looked up, and my heart is just like, the adrenaline came so fast. My heart is pumping, boom, boom, boom. And I just looked up at him and said, don't ever touch me again. And I continued talking to my cousin. So now he's, he got more courage. So he does the Wonder Woman pose and stands in front of me so I can't see the movie screen. Oh he stands right in front of me. So I looked up and I said, if I push this man down, I know he's going to break some ribs. He's going to be seriously hurt. If he falls into these seats, you know, because they go downhill. He's going to catch a bad one. So I finished talking to my cousin. I hung up the phone. At this, now my heart, my, my, my adrenaline is flying. Like my heart is beating like crazy. And my mind is just going all kind of places because everything I think about doing, I want to like maybe hit him in the side of the head so he'll fall to the side. So maybe he won't, <laughs> maybe he won't break his ribs on the seat. And that, yo, the adrenaline was talking to me. He was like, yo, you got to do something. <laughs> That's what that was saying. Okay. He hit you, man. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and he's standing there. So I sat there and I didn't say nothing. I said, at anything I do, it's, gonna, it's just gonna be, make it worse for me. Cause I'm the big black man and he the poor white man in the movie theater on Park Street. I mean, on New Park. So he went and sat down. So I said, let me just try to watch this movie. Chill, I know I was wrong. He lost his little mind, but I'm, I'm gonna eat that one. But this adrenaline would not stop. Adrenaline's like, yo, you gotta do something. <laughs> so after a while, I was like, okay. So I leaned forward where he was, 
And I said, listen, if you ever put your hands on me, I'll take your head through the back of this movie theater wall. No, no, I really apologize. I know I went too far. I, I apologize. I shouldn't have never touched you. I shouldn't have. I said, you're right. You really shouldn't have never touched me. But now while I'm talking to him, the adrenaline is like, yeah. It's almost like I'm getting high. I'm getting more higher because this adrenaline is rushing and it's trying to instigate something. And um, I said, no, man, don't say nothing else to me. Listen, I might get on the phone again. And should you say anything to me, come near me or touch me again, I will put your head through the back of this movie theater wall. And I sat down and I figured I'd be all right. And the adrenaline was like, yo, you ain't even cuss at him. <laughs> Adrenaline was pissed. That's all you gonna do? No, you gotta do something. My body would not let up. So I said, I can't watch this movie like this. Grab my coat, grab my stuff, left the movie theater. <clears throat> By the time I walked down those stairs, out the door, went through the movie theater front door. By the time I got to my car, <clears throat> Everything was back normal. The adrenaline rush was gone. And it was the most amazing thing to me. Like, it was totally freaking amazing. Because my body was in that fight or flight. Because it was felt danger and it threatened. But as soon as I left the environment, my body was like, all right, you're good. It was so amazing the way that changed, you know, and I was so happy to be cognizant, like to be consciously aware of how this was going on, you know, and, and so I can tell this story because what it means is that even when that, ad that adrenaline, like as you move, to be aggressive, adrenaline pumps more, and it's almost you start feeling good when you're releasing, and you, it's um, literally like you're getting high. Like when I was talking to him, it was almost like I was working myself up to hitting this dude. Mm -hmm. But I leaned back and sat back down. Now once I got outside and I realized what happened with my body, I was like, damn, this is amazing. I said, you know what? What if that guy had had a knife or a gun on him? What if he was acting that way and so courageous because he had something on him? And I leaned forward and threatened him and he cut my face or shot me in the face or something. Maybe he would have been justified. And in spite of all he did, my face would have been jacked up or I'd have been dead about talking on the phone. You know what I mean? And I, I reassessed it, and I said, as soon as he put his hands on me and I knew that I wasn't going to do anything, I should have left. Because sitting there, letting that adrenaline continue to pump and flow, that's what got me in his ear, threatening him. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was a, it was a great experience to, to be able to share with people how this thing works. And... If you can keep your wits about you enough to leave the environment, leave, go for a walk, jump in the car, whatever, but totally leave, then you don't have that urgency or that fight or flight feeling like you have to do something. And that's what's happening when we Google argument leads to a hit return. And we see all of these tragedies. N nobody left. And it'll keep going. And so finally, and the louder you argue, the more you yell, that adrenaline starts saying, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. And you start getting higher. You literally start feeling good. Like, it's crazy. But as you engage, you, you feel better. Until it comes to a point where something happens that everybody regrets and that's why we had, that's why we had those tragedies even later i think you watched watched
watching on social media, people will get on social media and they'll make us impulsive posts or, you know, we'll, we'll hold on to it until we feel like we have to let it go and we have to do something about it. You ever like do that? And, you know, post like, ah, and post something now that's out there. We have social media wars and kids are getting injured and bullied. Well, see, that's to me is just how out of control this thing has gotten. You read something on social media and now you're ready to go meet somebody to kill them or hurt them or you yeah. about some words that have been typed. See, those are the things that I'm saying that we have so much more control over that we don't exercise yes. because we're operating in an environment where it's the norm Conflict and confrontation is the norm. You dig? Yeah. yeah. A father leaps to his death with his four-year-old son after arguing with his wife over who should look after the child when he was ill. Real story. Him and his wife had an argument over who should look after the child while the child was ill. Maybe who should stay home from work. And he took the four-year-old and then jumped, and they both died. An argument over texting in the Florida movie theater ended with a retired Tampa police captain fatally shooting a man sitting in front of him. Mm. A woman in Brooklyn will spend the next 15 years in prison after pleading guilty to manslaughter in the stabbing death of her friend. The two began arguing over Facebook. The argument escalated even further when the two met in person. The victim reportedly reached for a pair of scissors. The eventual felon went for a knife and swung it, stabbing the victim once. She died from blood loss. Uh, we, once we get into that argument and let it escalate and, and we don't leave or remove ourselves, we're playing Russian roulette because we don't know how it's going to end at that point. So, we understand the ground rules for a conscious conversation? Yes. yes. So anything in particular y'all want to put on the table and talk about? You know, have a little brief conversation, just put it out there, and let's go. What were we talking about beforehand? Submissive women? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, what, what do you want to say about Sibla? Well, what is the male perspective on submissive? So, it depends on what we call a submissive. Okay, let's define it. Let's define submissive. What is submissive? See, I don't like that term, period. Yeah. So, I, I, I just, to me, it's not submissive. It's a mutual kind of cooperation because I think both people are, are digging each other to the extent that there's a mutual cooperation. And uh, like for instance, you say a man earns a submissive woman if he is a responsible man, boom, 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 something like that, right? <clears throat> and what I'm saying, is this more of a mutual cooperation between two people who love and respect each other? <clears throat> not submissive on either. Because the woman is not gonna um, be mutually cooperative with a man who is not earning it, right? True. Right. So, and the man who is earning it is in turn being mutually cooperative as well. So I'd rather identify it as a couple functioning in, in a mutually cooperative way and as opposed to a woman being submissive. This is true. So for me, yeah. and, and I think when a woman, I think, I think it is like so sexy when a woman uh, 
demonstrates the ability to be mutually cooperative? And so when I say I think it's so sexy when a woman demonstrates the ability to be mutually cooperative, I, I say that because of the state of our relationships in general as it relates to black men and women. And we are so out of control as men that you have to dig real, real deep to find a woman who demonstrates the ability to be mutually cooperative. Um, yeah, you gotta dig pretty deep because we're out of control. But we're, and at the same time, uh, this is where my eyes get scratched out. <laughs> hold on. At the same, hold it, hold it. At the same time, I'm gonna say this, and 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 um, I've survived. <laughs> at least at least two attempts on my life in the hair salon by from saying this. But women got the juice card and there's nothing a man can do that a woman doesn't accept in spite of how men should behave and what should be done should is not reality what is is reality and we got to live based on what is not should and what I'm saying is that I know for a fact a woman who doesn't accept BS won't get none. If you accept it, then that's what you're going to get. And as a man, I'm be the first to acknowledge that we can get relaxed and lax days ago and get a little out of control. And um, take advantage of the situation. So, as far as I'm concerned, the state of relationships, and I'm talking about black folks right now, between black men and women is such that there's very little, what did I call it, mutual, what, what was the language I was using to explain it? Y'all don't remember? Because you didn't want to say submissive. Uh, Huh? It was a mutual agreement, understanding. No, no, mutual cooperation, mutual. Mutual cooperation. Mu mutual interaction. Yeah, there we go. So, so, um, so that is like so far down the road because women are defensive, men are defensive, men are out of control, and then there's a, 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 a the degree of a certain degree of anger going on about the behavior of men. But I'll always go back to, if you want a good man, then don't accept anything less than the goodness you want. So I'm done. You said a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. I'm trying to remember everything that I wanted to respond to. Um, I. It's deep, deep. Right. So, um, okay, it's great when we have the mutual cooperation going on. That was a really great phrase to use because I always believe in duality. So if, if the give and receive is flowing properly, then that will allow the relationship produce the harmonious communication. That Ain't nobody being submissive. Hold on now. Yes. Excuse yes. me, just the term that every 
everybody's familiar with, but I agree with what you said about yeah. Yes, I like this you know, because that's, yeah, yes. that, that made it, because it is a give and take. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we, as women, do have the juice card, we do <laughs> approve and give the okay for the BS. So in turn, it's like, how you mad with what you putting up with? See, I can't say that. And see that, but that, I can say that for me. I can say that for me. That was like, ooh, that's kind of true. I can't be mad for putting up with the BS because I'm accepting what is, and that's my reality. And if I'm not different, then I have to change Which how I'm handling it. So, yeah, and we're not around being mad. If we run around being mad and complaining about men being mad, then and we don't have to complain. It's, 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 it's us accepting it. Yeah, we accept it. It's not responsible. We have responsibility. We got to do it. Exactly. And once we don't accept it any longer, it stops becoming okay. And then quite naturally, men will do what's necessary in order to gain. And tell us about that juice card. Our attention. <laughs> our oh, the juice card is real. I, yeah, I want, but I want to explain that juice card a little bit more. This is the juice card. Okay. And I have had. Um, at least three attempts on my eyes getting scratched out. <laughs> <laughs> on the juice card? Because of my understanding of the juice card. So when I say women have the juice card, what I mean is, again, this is not how what should be or supposed to be or how men should, whatever. This has nothing to do with what men should. This has to do with how it is. And when I say women have the juice card, what I mean is this. And you meet a man and y'all dig each other and he likes you and he digs you. You determine the quality of the relationship every single time. You choose the man every single time and you determine the quality of the relationship every time. You know how you choose them? How it's 100% fact you choose them. When you crack them legs open, that's when the choice is made, according to me. Because you are allowing a person to enter into you. And you made the choice to do that. And for a lot of men, we see that that's when the choice is made too. That's why so many men, once we get some, we get a little relaxed. We're like, huh, you know? You get a little beside ourselves. <laughs> because that means we've been chose. Oh so, my God. so what I'm saying is women dictate the quality of the relationship. And, and what I was saying on the boat to the sisters is this. Um, <laughs> I was saying this. A lot of women are afraid to find out whether or not a man really likes them. Because when it comes down to saying this is beyond anything I'm willing to accept. When you say that and you mean it, what you're saying is you need to make a choice. You're going to be here or you're not. But women rarely do that. It's, it's a lot of women who are afraid that he's going to say, well, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and bounce. So they never push it to that place. They just fuss and talk mm -hmm. and threaten and fuss and talk and threaten and make themselves miserable. And then what I'm saying is, as long as you are frustrated about something for an extended period of time and continue accepting it, that means you're compromising your self-respect. Exactly. When you compromise your self-respect, you then neutralize all of the innate things that alert you when something is out of order. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that, that's done. You, you, now you just out there on the limb when you begin compromising your self-respect. And this is why it starts. Now you, you just, you're just out there. And this is how it goes, it keeps going and you get more and deeper hurt 
because you don't even have yourself to protect you anymore. You dig what I'm saying? And so it's not enough women. If you, you always getting to know somebody, you never know them. I don't give a damn if y'all been in each other's face for 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 15 years. You don't know that person. Y'all gonna continue getting to know each other. So what happens is if you know that you don't know this man, or as a man, you don't know this woman. If you know that from the giddy up, from the start, you understand, I don't know this person. I'm just continuing to get to know the person. When you see something that's not familiar or something that startles you or takes you aback, you don't have that emotional reaction of, I thought I knew you. I don't know who the hell you are. Well, no, you didn't know the person and never did. What happens now is when you all go in knowing that you don't know the person, when you see something that takes you aback, you say, oh, okay. I need to make a decision whether or not that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's not acceptable and you really mean it, don't matter how long you've been married, it don't matter how many people witnessed it at the wedding, it don't matter how your mother and your grandmother feel about them, when you decide that there is something that is not acceptable, then you got to be ready to put it all on the line. Because if you go there with it and don't follow through, then the respect diminishes yeah. for what you have to say. So if it's something that's just that out of order and not acceptable, you got to be ready to put it all on the line if you bring it up and go there. But if you go there and play with it and don't take it to the wall and mean it, then the respect is diminished significantly. And I always talk about what I call the four stages of the breakup. A woman comes to him and says, listen, this is not acceptable, this is not cool, I'm not with it. What a man does the first time as you say it is, it. <laughs> why are you tripping, quit, stop. Then when you re-bring it up the second time, our mind is off. She just needs some attention. I got some tickets to the comedy show. Let's go, go out and eat. Now nah, she just needs it. When you continue saying, no, this is not acceptable, now he's uncomfortable. He's still not taking you serious, but he's uncomfortable. So now he gets pissed off. Now, he's looking to point to your faults and uh, change the narrative and all manner of things because he's uncomfortable. And so now you are looking around, next thing you know, you're defending yourself. You started out putting your foot down about something and the next thing you know, you, you're defending yourself. He, he, he didn't switch the narrative and, and he's pissed and uh, and man, he mad, he, he done lost it. Usually that's when it stops. Usually by, right about that time is when a woman backs off. We never get to stage four. And the reason why we have a stage four is because of all of the crap that's been accepted prior. Stage four is when he realizes you serious. And he be like, damn, she's serious. And that's when the man has to make a decision about what he gonna do. Cause it don't, it ain't, it ain't I, what am I gonna do? Do I love enough to stay or am I gonna bounce? Or, now, how much do I really care for this person? All of these things he ain't had to think about. Once he realized you're serious, the problem with that is when you let it get to stage four, while he's contemplating, you done concluded. That's what I was waiting for. True. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the contemplation is, I, I'm done. It's a wrap. You, you making plans. You done already got to a, a little apartment set up. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You, 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 you done. So this is why 
<laughs> this is why after you you go ahead and follow through with your plans and he'd be like, hold up, wait a minute, no, wait, 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 no. And, and, and you're done. Now he's calling your mother, calling your grandmother, calling your friends, calling the kids. What's the matter? I don't know what's the matter with her. I told her, but don't nobody know we done been through three stages. Mm -hmm. you, your stages, I mean, you're a man, you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. It, it's, 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 I don't want to use the word refreshing, but it does my heart good to hear a man actually admit mm -hmm. that there are steps and every step that you mention defines Damn. the ending of my long-term relationship. And step four is like you said, that's why I said I was waiting on that. Mm -hmm. Step four, when you realize, okay, she's serious, I have to do, mm -hmm. we're already done. A lot of times by then it is too late. Too late. So I so appreciate you saying that. I so so appreciate you saying those words. And, and the fact that a man knows this too, that's, the, that's the kicker. The fact that he's, he's letting us in on that side of the, of the male being. The reality, <laughs> from a reality place, right? Yes, yes. And, uh, and yeah, and so, you know, but By, by the time we get to four, let me tell you, it's been a lot of self-respect being compromised. You know, and that's the part that I'm talking about. And I'm saying, y'all run this thing. I had a customer, I saw this dude, he was speaking full, complete sentences at four years old. She would have him in a tie, He's a yes sir, yes ma'am. I mean, this dude was the most amazing, perfect gentleman, like at four and five. And he carried himself, walked straight up, you know, he, and you just look at him like this little man, it was amazing. And, you know, on another note, we have so much juice with our kids that we don't exercise. We can produce some incredible people. And he was just a great example. And he had a full scholarship to Hampton University. He got older. Full scholarship to Hampton University. I watched this dude grow up. He was there one semester. And she came in the salon and she said, Alfonso, since he's been back from school, I don't know who that is. I said, what do you mean? You should have heard the way he was talking to this girl on the phone. I would have never, ever. And I said, well, you know why he's talking to her like that? Because he likes her. And that's what she's used to and what she wants. And he made the adjustment. All that training, all that so-called youth, the perfect gentleman stuff, we adjust to y'all. Especially when we doing some liking. Especially when you, uh, uh, you know, you demonstrate self-respect. It's, it's just, it's the basic, like, you know how somebody talk about playing hard to get? You know why playing hard to get is so successful for a lot of people? It's because the other person can respect when they have to work. But then the, the period of hard to get ends and our work ends. Mm. We following y'all. You dig what I'm saying? <laughs> and so a sister in the salon oh man I almost got cut on this day this was beyond eye scratching they were in the salon and they were talking about how um, men can't handle a strong woman 
they want these little weak, submissive women. They can't handle a strong woman. They can't handle a strong woman, blah, 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 blah. And I was trying to stay out of it. And I couldn't, I couldn't stay out of it no longer. I said, hold it, wait a minute, stop the bus. Let's have this conversation. It's not about we can't handle a strong woman. And you're not going to like what I have to say. But the reality is this. We don't have to. Because there's doctors and lawyers and brilliant women from any stretch, any part of society willing to put up with our shit. So what happens is the strong or women who are not, you get misled into believing because you're strong. And what I'm trying to tell you is as a man, it ain't got nothing to do with you strong. It has to do with the fact that we don't have to deal with that because there's a whole bunch out here in every level of, of society who will put up with us. And I'm talking about from the most beautiful and brilliant on over to the hood and everywhere else. It's just, it's just the ones who are willing to put up with our stuff outnumber the ones who are not. So it's not that men avoid strong women. Men don't have to deal with that. For what? We need to rile our women up and <laughs> get on the same page. We do it at justice. You understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. No, no. Yeah, I mean, I. In the, in, the, in the same way that we have the juice bar. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And if everybody's Giving up the juice girl, bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate to say it like that, but you know, and it was. I felt so bad. I felt so. I felt bad because it was quiet after that. Like, but I'm just I'm coming from I'm coming from an honest perspective of a man. We needed that. We needed that. You know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You up some girl that's but the mutual cooperation thing and the, um, what I found was so sexy about that mutual cooperation was that it was initiated. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like, I didn't necessarily earn it, but it might have been just a part of her spirit and her energy. That's just how she is. Maybe that's how she's raised. I don't know. But the way she initiated it, it was just so warm and sexy and nice. It just made me melt like, damn. You know, and um, it's, I, I think that, you know, there's no telling how that can affect people. Mm -hmm. um, but be, be, because of us and our situation, you, we have people constantly promoting conflict between black men and women, constantly on social yes. media, That's constantly. True. That's true. And so sisters don't even feel comfortable to present that side. Right. But this is the thing. You can feel comfortable presenting that side with self-respect and with an understanding of somebody who can't handle it and not ready, don't deserve it, and ain't getting it. Mm -hmm. There's no, no need to have the attitude and then not present it because of what maybe happened in the past. Like, you still in control. Even if you present that side, you still in control. You still in control. You still determine whether or not you gonna to decide to allow them in your space. It's always sexy and attractive to have somebody say something and and give you the sense of control. She presented you with her feelings, with her emotion, and she allowed you to make that choice as to where it would go or how you wanted it. But, and, and that was cool. And, but guess what? If she had to continue to get to know me better, in the same manner, she could have looked and said, I, I, I'm just so attracted to your aura and everything, but I don't think this is, this is good for me. 
And don't have to lose none of that. Don't have to compromise none of that. But just be clear, you know, on what is acceptable and what's not. And so rather than understanding that that can still be a part of the sisters and be present and be expressed, it's withdrawn. You know, it's like in the attic, in the crate somewhere, and leave the house without it. Because I got to be ready for these. Negroes. And I'm saying to myself, yeah. you don't have to be ready. All you do is have to be clear about yourself. And communicate that. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, just from, from how you describe her, I feel like she was confident and strong, mm -hmm. but not angry. Yep. And clear. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I can guarantee you, I personally believe if I had done or said something that wasn't her cup of tea, she would have looked she me right in my eyes the same way and said, this has been nice. I'm going to go with my friends now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I'm saying. You don't have to protect what you not disrespected. Mm -hmm. Right? That makes sense. So anyway, I um anything else you want to put on the table before we close? This has been a wonderful conscious conversation. Yes. 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 And uh, yeah, we definitely gotta do more. See, we didn't even scratch your eyes out. Right, because <laughs> that's why I was like so clear about the. Wait, I'm them out. I'm no, them out. no personal yeah, attacks. Talking about the dick and the dick Yeah. Sometimes it ain't it ain't it ain't available even if you dig deep. Like I said, it's all up in the attic. So. <laughs> you done left it in the house. So, uh, so we all good? Yeah, we're all good. Well, I, I appreciate um, y'all for participating in this conscious conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sure um, I always get something out of, discussion, out of the discussions, and I hope y'all did too. Okay. And we're going to keep doing this. We're going to do some more. We're going to come up with different subjects. Today, we just let the subject ride based on how we were already talking. <laughs> and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have subject matter ahead of time, what we're gonna deal with, and continue having conscious conversations. Sounds, Sounds lovely. So Harford is lit. We doing the doggone thing. We got the book fair, book festival coming up May, May 18th. 18. 2019. We're going to be celebrating Malcolm X's birthday, which is on May 19th. We're going to have panel discussions and workshops. If you have any interest in um, participating or getting involved in the book festival, you can contact us on the Hartford Lit page on Facebook. Or you can contact me. And uh, anything else we need to let the people know? December 29th, Harper's Lit will have our first book chat discussion mm -hmm. on um, the book Becoming at the Harper's oh, okay. Library or Albany Avenue. Oh, December 29th, a book, book chat. Yes. Michelle Obama's book. Yes, on Becoming. Becoming. December 27th, 29th. 29th, what time? 1 to 3.30. From 1 o'clock to 3.30 at the Hartford Public Library on Albany Avenue. On Albany Avenue. That's cool because, um, see, y'all give a nice time for actual conversation. Some people be calling themselves having a, a whole panel discussion for 45 minutes. <laughs> and then they spend 15 of those 45 introducing the panelists. And then let one person ask a question from the audience and it'd be over. <laughs> so, 
So December 29th, Michelle Obama's book, Hartford Public Library, Albany Avenue Branch. S what time? One o'clock to three thirty. Okay. All right. Well, I thank y'all for tuning in. I appreciate you. I am Alfonso McGriff III. This is Hartford's Lit. Hartford's Lit. Doing the doggone thing. Y'all have a wonderful evening. I'm out. Peace.